Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Klaus Svahn, and I am uh, International Director for Euro for Sweden and Chairman for Archives for the Unexplained. I have been actively researching UFOs since 1974. Things were quite different in the 1970s. My glasses were larger and I had much more hair. But my attitude regarding UFO phenomena were quite the same as they are now. I still recognize my most reports are misidentifications of natural phenomena and that some are real, still unidentified objects. As the headline says, I am no flying saucer nerd, but the person who seeks an explanation, whatever the explanation may be. Most of my free time I spend documenting and researching this world of ours. Some years ago, Geo for Sweden interviewed 1,600 people in the southern part of Sweden. More than 20 investigators knocked doors and asked people if they had seen something in the sky that they had not been able to identify. The result was that 1 in 10 had an experience of the unknown. Most of them had never reported it to anyone. To be able to do this, UFO Sweden holds an annual field investigation training course since 1976. And earlier this year, I had the opportunity to educate these 45 new and old ufologists. They are now prepared to do investigations of their own. Well, now to my point. <clears throat> I will tell you about three topics. The ghost rockets. More than 1,000 reported in 1946 alone. I will also tell you about the search for one more recent ghost rocket that landed and sank in a lake in 1980. And about AFU, the archives for the unexplained, the world's largest archive regarding UFOs and other, <coughs> sorry, and other strange phenomena. AFU started in 1973 and is now used by researchers all around the world. This is the real X-Files. So let's start with AFU, that of course can be found in, on the internet at afu.se. This small film shows one of the main premises, one of 12 localities we have on the same street. We are handling email requests, cataloging UFO reports, managing the AFU shop from where we are selling surplus copies of books and magazines on the walls, artwork and posters. Today this is a huge undertaking. Those 12 premises are 500 square meters in total, 2,200 meters of bookshelves, 32,000 books, 73,000 magazines, seven 650,000 articles from newspapers, 42,000 UFO reports from Sweden, the UK, Denmark, Russia, Norway, 60 meters of Swedish UFO history, 10 meters of international UFO history, 4,100 reel-to-reel -reel and audio cassettes, 2,700 VHS, CD and DVD recordings, 120 microfilms, 30,000 photos, and more than 1,000 objects, models, artwork, t-shirts, posters, etc. To make this run, we have 50 sponsors paying a monthly fee. Eight board members, five archive volunteers, several out-of-work employees and work trainees can be found at day a few an ordinary day. Files are finding their way to AFU in many ways. Since the early 1990s, I would travel to Great Britain to save books, case files, pictures, magazines, films and paraphernalia from attics, basements and overfilled rooms in houses of ufologists. This picture shows one such trip with 303 boxes from British ufologists before being shipped to Sweden. We are today a truly fortune archive, not just about UFOs, but everything that you can fit under the description, the unknown, is to be found here. I will give you some brief examples of what you can see at AFU. 
Here are some nice posters from the 1950s, old newspaper clippings, pictures of people like this of Roy and Barbara Win Stanley out hunting for UFOs in the 1960s. Books on ghosts and parapsychology, <coughs> models and toys. Seldom seen first generation copies like this George Adamski picture from September, September the 3rd, 1951. And more well-known ones. Stephen Derbyshire's famous picture taken at Coniston February 15, 1954. Pictures from far away, of course, like this from Sao Paulo, October 13, 13, 1968, taken by a 15-year-old boy. And the Almiro Barauna picture, of course, very famous, seen over the Trinidad Islands in 1958. Or this obvious lens flare from Buenos Aires in Argentina, 1965. Let's now turn your attention to one of the greatest UFO mysteries of all time, the ghost rockets. With the first daylight report on May 21st, 1946, it preceded many nighttime observations. This was to be the year of the ghost rockets. More than 1,000 reports in less than a year was investigated by the Swedish defense authorities. In the early 1980s, AFU found thousands of pages at the Swedish War Archive. At that point, they were still classified. Reports about cigar-shaped objects crossing the sky, one year before the term flying saucers were coined, and one year before discussions about extraterrestrial visitors started. Today we have published the documents on ghostrockets.se, many of them translated into English. Let us take a look at what was happening in 1946. During six months, hundreds of reports of cigar-shaped objects came pouring in from all over Sweden, and Norway, and Finland, and some from Denmark. Here are some pictures and a typical report. In July 1946, it was impossible for the military to sit and watch this flood of reports anymore. A special group was formed under Colonel Bengt Jakobsson. It worked during the rest of the year, investigating hundreds of alleged sightings. Not only the Swedes showed an interest into the ghost rockets. In this letter from the British Embassy in Stockholm to the Foreign Office in London, it is stated that one British officer undercover as a tourist should travel to Sweden and that this must be kept secret, but for a very limited number of high-ranking officers. But the Americans had their own channels, and we have found copies of documents in Washington, D.C., showing that they did know what was going on. We also know that President Truman was briefed about the ghost rockets. Three days after the ghost rockets group was found, and a very unusual string of events happened over the northern part of Sweden. Let us take a look at Friday the 19th of July 1946. On this day, on four different locations, four ghost rockets crashed into lakes. Kjell Danielsson, 14 years of age at the time, worked out in this field together with his two brothers and their father. In a nearby field, a neighbor was driving a harvesting machine. Kjell Danielsson told me that the three boys took a break in the very hot and nice weather. It was 24 degrees Celsius in a clear blue sky. Looking towards the southern horizon, they all realized that a large object was coming over the treetops. It was flying against the wind. The boys tried to make their father ask the neighbor to shut down the harvester so that they could hear if any sound was coming from the strange object that now climbed to a position right above them. But their father thought them lazy and did not ask the neighbor. During the nearly 20 minutes, they could see this metallic object turning slowly around its own axis while crossing the entire sky and eventually disappearing 
behind the horizon in the north. Within minutes after Sheldon Nielsen lost contact with the strange object, an 11-year-old boy was sitting angling at the shore of a small lake 250 kilometers further north. What you see in this picture is a copy of a newspaper report of the event. As with all other witnesses that I am referring to, I have also talked with Kurt Larsson, who describes the event as frightening. Kurt Larsson heard a sound as from a very strong wind falling down from the sky. At the other end of the lake, he saw an object crashing, leaving a nearly 15 meter high column of water after it. He ran to his father, who was working nearby, shouting, the devil is in the lake. Together they returned to the shore, but the object had vanished under the surface. At 11.45, 15 minutes later, at Lake Kölmjör, a couple of hundred kilometers further north, Knut Lindbeck and Beda Persson were out working in the fields as so many other Swedes did this beautiful summer day. On the other side of the lake was another witness, Fridi Bortagebo. Together with many other people from the village that was situated at the lake, they heard a sound as from a very strong storm approaching from, the above, from above. When they turned their attention to the sky, they all saw an elongated cigar-shaped craft falling towards the lake. The grey craft, estimated to be two meters long, had two small wings at its sides. And uh, it was traveling at a tremendous pace. Seconds later, a big splash was heard and a column of water was thrown up in the sky, directly followed by an explosion and another huge column of water. The windows were rattling and dogs and cats ran for shelter. When Knut Lindbeck took his boat out of the point of impact, he could see large water lilies cut off from the bottom and stones and mud thrown on the shore. Three hours and 15 minutes later, on this same day, and a couple of hundred kilometers further north, a whole family heard a strange and prolonged thunder and went outside their summer cottage. Ulla Axberg, who I talked to, was 17 at the time and remember seeing an object crashing into the lake, traveling under the surface until it exploded a couple of hundred meters away on the other side of a small bay. A large column of water was thrown into the air and bushes and vegetation was moving from a strong wind. 40 minutes after that, further south this time, the family was out sunbathing at the shore of Lake Marmen. Ingrid Sander told me that she heard a very strong noise and saw an object hitting the surface near the shore. She could see the strange object skipping over the water surface, leaving a wake after it before exploding with a 20 meter column of water thrown up in the sky. And seconds later, she could see the water turn black. One day after those events in the north of Sweden, military sent investigators to one of the lakes, Lake Kölmjör, where the ghost rocket had been seen cutting water lilies and threw large, large stones up onto the shore. Two experts on radiation were sent from Stockholm, since the Defense Research Institute suspected the craft being powered by nuclear material and remotely controlled by TV. A week later, a raft was being constructed with a metal detector on board. During two weeks of search, 35,000 samples were taken from the seafloor. An indentation was found at the site where Knut Lindbeck had seen the object crash and explode. But in spite of using an electric minesweeping device beside the metal detector, nothing was found. In 1984, I interviewed Carlos Dabartol, the man who led this search in Lake Kölmjör, and the man you saw on the raft. He said, I suspect that the bomb was manufactured from a lighter material, for example, a magnesium alloy. It probably disintegrated, which uh, the second water column indicates. We did find the point of impact. In the mud on the seafloor, we could see how stones and gravel 
were laying thrown away from the bottom layer beneath them. After six months of investigations and nearly a year of reports of strange objects in the sky, the Ghost Rocket Committee sent their report to the Supreme Commander in December 1946. They concluded 973 reports between April 25th and November 29th. 450 of these non-astronomical. 225 of these real objects. 42% cigar shaped with no wings, 8% cigar shaped with wings and 100 reported impacts, all in lakes. The origin of the ghost rockets were never identified. The ghost rockets peaked in 1946, but observations of those cigar-shaped objects did not stop after that. Let us turn to my last item, and to a more recent ghost rocket. Bo Berg, now section manager at the Swedish War Archives, and his wife Liss, now head of three schools in the Stockholm area, were out hiking in Muddus National Park in the extreme north of Sweden on July 31st, 1980. It was at 11.50 when they had stopped for a short break. The weather was nice but cloudy. Suddenly they heard a noise coming from the south. A strange craft came flying towards them less than 100 meters over the ground. When it passed right over them, they estimated the length to be between 3 and 5 meters. They followed the object over them, going towards the lake behind them, Lake Namajar. But instead of passing the lake, the object turned 180 degrees and came back towards them. It was long, cigar-shaped, had small wings or something on each side. In his diary, Bouvet wrote just two hours later, First I thought it was an airplane then a cruise missile, then a UFO. The two baffled witnesses could see the strange craft descending on the lake with a splash, and after a few seconds it started to sink, bubbles of air coming from it. They decided to head back to their vehicle. The car was parked a couple of hours further west. Coming back to Stockholm, they reported their sighting to this man, Sture Vickerts, at the time, head of the UFO desk at the Defense Research Institute. Sture Vickers, whose notes you can see here, checked the radar, aircraft, helicopters and nearby shooting ranges, but found no solution to the mystery. He even sent a helicopter trying to locate the craft, but the water was too muddy and nothing could be seen. After that, the story was forgotten for many years until I found Mr. Vickers' notes in the files. In 2012, UFO Sweden decided to go back to the lake, together with the original witnesses, 32 years older, to pinpoint the location and to look for the object. Together with the witnesses traveled a team of UFO Sweden members and experts. We were trying to see if we could solve one of the most enigmatic ghost rocket observations in modern times. The lake is situated right in the middle of nowhere. To bring equipment and personnel requires special permission from the authorities, the area being a natural park, and a helicopter to lift the 1,300 kilos of equipment we brought with us.
Ölke. Ó. Tá bom, né, na foto. Det känns fel. Det känns fel. We covered the lake with a side scan sonar and after a couple of hours the entire lake was scanned. After looking through the sonar film we sent divers down the next day but they discovered the same problem as the lake where so many other ghost rockets have been seen crashing during the years. It was muddy and here you can see the message from one of the divers to the other. Damn it. It is completely impossible. The floor of the lake was covered with four meters of mud. An object sinking in the lake would immediately have been covered by the mud. In 2014 we went back to the lake with equipment that could see down this mud. And we did get some interesting radar returns. Here you can see a large object resting in the mud. What it is, we do not know. But the new expedition is already planned. This time we will go in the winter with snowmobiles to look through the ice and through the mud. With the three-dimensional radar, they can see what the object really looks like. And for the first time, we may be able to see what the ghost rocket looks like. Or if this is something completely different resting there. And maybe solve a 60 year old enigma. And with this selfie of myself and my son Niklas at the shore of Lake Namayar with the northern lights in the sky behind us, I thank you for your attention and hopefully our next expedition to this remote lake will help us to shed some light, light on the mystery that I've puzzled ufologists for decades. Thank you. <laughs>